Teleology is the study of design and purpose in nature. For everything that's made, there's a maker. For everything that's painted, there's a painter. For every statue, there's a sculptor. William Paley is the one who popularized this thought in his book, Natural Theology, in the 1700s. He used an illustration of walking through a field and seeing lots of stones, but coming across a watch. Whereas there were thousands of stones affected by wind, erosion, and so forth, there's a difference between a stone and a watch. Everybody could see the difference between the stone and the watch. For example, on the watch you have a hand, if it's got a second hand, if it's digital you've got numbers, you've got some kind of attachment to your wrist, you've got a wristband, and so forth. The watch clearly requires a watchmaker, but the stone just is sort of a product of time and chance. Well, Paley recognized that living creatures were far more complex than any watch that was ever constructed. Thus, by just simple logic or common sense, it indicates that living systems must have a designer. He recognized this intelligent planning in design, and this intelligent planning in nature is called the teleological argument. The universe from the atoms on up show order and design. Gary Parker has a similar example. He uses the fact that say a person was walking down a creek bed where there were thousands of stones. Among the stones he would find an Indian arrowhead. There's just something different about the Indian arrowhead. The arrowhead has sharp corners and sharp features on it, shaping it in what we would call the arrow type shape, while the stone just has the form of wind and erosion. Without seeing the Indian or his arrow making process, one immediately recognizes evidences of design and purpose in the arrowhead compared to the stone which has no design and no purpose. Likewise, a haphazard mixture of glass, wire, plastic, metal, and so forth does not cause an airplane to be built which can fly. There must be an airplane designer. Likewise, an explosion in a brick factory does not produce a building. There's got to be architects and builders. B.J. Rangathan, he uses the illustration of two people walking down the seashore and seeing a sandcastle on the beach. Now these two people could look at this sandcastle and agree on a lot of things. They could agree, for example, the color is sort of gray. They could agree if they had a rule or something approximately how high the sandcastle was. They may even agree on the density, approximately what they think the mass of the sandcastle. But when it comes to origins, how it came to be there, they could have some entirely different viewpoints. When you measure it, when you get the color, uh, when you measure the distance from the ocean, all these things would be observable, repeatable. But when it comes to how it got there, since none of them were there when the sandcastle got there, the origin questions could be quite different. One person could believe that the sandcastle just originated there just by the wind, the washing of the sand up on the seashore and formed this sandcastle with its steps, turrets, and so forth. The other person says, no, there must have been some sculptor or team of sculptors who carved out these intricate stairs and turrets and, and windows and so forth. Now really, neither one can prove their position scientifically because neither observed how it got there. But let me ask you a question, which makes more sense? How many of you believe that that sandcastle got there by winds and waves, erosion and so forth that just happened to form that way? Or how many of you think there must have been a designer? 
I would say everyone listening to me right now would recognize there must have been a designer. It is much more reasonable. The faith of, in the idea that there was a sculpture is much more reasonable than the faith in the idea that time and chance caused that sand castle. Ken Ham uses this example. If you were going through South Dakota, there is an area of South Dakota called the Badlands. You can see from the picture why it's called Badlands. Very difficult to grow crops. It's just rugged dirt caused by erosion, wind, storms, and so forth. Just formless, practically lifeless. There's some vegetation, but very difficult to achieve anything. And you can see how this happened just more or less by time and chance and wind and erosion and so forth. But you drive a little further to an area of South Dakota called the Black Hills. You come up to a place called Mount Rushmore and you see on the mountain heads that look like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln. What do you think? Do you think that these are products of wind and erosion? Or do you think there was a sculptor who made that look like George Washington? Actually even put the glasses on Teddy Roosevelt. You can see the beard of Abraham Lincoln. Did that happen by just millions of years of wind and water erosion? Well, fortunately, we know the sculptor. The sculptor was got some borogram. He designed and supervised the work from 1927 until his death in 1941. And his son took over and completed the work. But without even knowing that, you would something in common sense tells you behind a sculpture such as this, there must have been a sculptor. Behind things that are complex, there must be designers. I have in my hand a walnut and a half of a walnut. And if you can look at this walnut closely, you'll find that this is a tremendous design. It is very light, but very strong. The strength to weight ratio is phenomenal. It's got a rigid dome shape, a corrugated, made up of very lightweight material. The purpose is to protect the walnut meat inside the walnut. Was this just a product of evolution, time and chance? Or do you think somebody designed the walnut? I think somebody designed it. Even the earthworm, which we don't consider as a very, shall we say, complex as far as nature is concerned and its abilities, but even earthworms are specifically designed creatures. Of course, they provide food for birds, but they have a purpose also. They burrow through the ground. They make an important contribution to fertilization, aeration, even drainage of the soil. Now, this valuable work that the worms perform, was this just mutations, natural selection, struggle for existence, evolutionists would propose? No, I am convinced that the Creator designed worms, even the lowly worms, to be a servant of the world. Everything has a purpose. The next picture I'm showing is the woodpecker. The woodpecker is a very interesting bird. It has a strong chisel-like beat. How many of you could beat your head against a tree without having a splitting headache or a concussion? But a woodpecker pecks at the wood and hits that wood with a tremendous force. It must have some kind of built-in shock absorber system. Even the toes are arranged so they can hold on to a tree. Two toes are pointed forward, two toes are pointed backwards. The tail provides a stiff support for it as it pecks away at the wood. The, the tongue is coated with the saliva to get the bugs and so on. But one of the most interesting things is that the tongue can reach out several inches, I believe up to about 10 or 12 inches. It's not that the tongue is so long, but there's a hyoid that's on the top of its head that enables that tongue to stick out way out there and get the food that it's looking for. 
Did the woodpecker's bill, toes, tail, and so forth just evolve? Are they products of time and chance? Or do you think there was a designer behind the woodpecker? Penguins are interesting creatures. The penguin is an unusual bird in that its wings aren't really used for flying. These short flippers are designed for swimming. Feet are used for steering, and they're at the end of the body rather than the middle of the body of most birds. The long, thin feathers have fluffy tufts at their base so the wind and water penetrate. There's a layer of blubber underneath the feathers that the penguin has. That serves as an insulator to the cold. The breeding patterns, very unusual. Penguins may walk as far as 80 or 90 miles inward to the breeding ground. You can see where thousands of penguins are on this particular area. Now when the female lays its egg, it rolls its egg down to her feet, then covers it with a fold of skin to keep it from freezing. Then the male comes along, she rolls the egg over to him, he takes it onto his feet, covers it with his skin, she goes to the sea, maybe 80 miles away, goes to the sea, goes fishing, gets fish in her stomach, gets fish in her mouth and so forth, comes back. How she finds her mate out of all these other penguins, to me they all look alike. She finds her mate just in time, brings the food for the chick, and then the male penguin goes out and gets food and repeats that until the penguin is grown enough to survive. Was this breeding pattern, were these unusual characteristics just products of evolution? I think not. I think they were carefully designed by our great creator. The wombat's an interesting species. Wombat is a marsupial, what's meant by a marsupial is they have a pouch where they carry their undeveloped young in there after it was born. They're a thick set, short legged, tailless, somewhat like a badger like creature, it lives primarily in Australia. The interesting thing about the wombat is its pouch opens backwards. You know, on a kangaroo, it opens upward. On a wombat, the pouch turns the other way. I heard it said that an evolutionist guide in Australia was explaining this to an audience and saying how evolution is so wonderful over millions of years this pouch turned itself backwards so that the animal could burrow on the ground. Pitiful explanation because what would have happened to the baby wombats for the million years until it was turned around? They would have got their faces full of mud and they would have died. No, the backward pouch is evidence of careful designing by the Creator who designed things properly in the beginning. The giraffe is a very interesting animal. It is probably the tallest animal that is on earth today. Giraffes are up to 18 feet tall. The giraffe has some very interesting design features. The giraffe has the highest blood pressure that I know of any animal because the heart has to be large, has to be able to pump that blood up to the brain. Severe damage would occur if the brain received no blood. On the other hand, the brain would be damaged if there was too much blood flowing to it. So when the giraffe bends over to drink of water, what keeps that blood from rushing and damaging the brain? Carefully designed valves in the blood vessels are there to slow down the flow and the pressure of blood. Also, there seems to be some spongy tissue that acts as sort of a shock absorber for it. Do you think these special features of large special valves, spongy tissue near the brain, that they all evolve at the same time? Was this a product of time and chance? It is so much easier to believe that God created the entire giraffe. Yes, God has a purpose in the design of all his creation. And I want to tell you today, God has a purpose for your life. You are not products of time and chance. You are not accidents. God has a plan and a purpose. It's important for you to find your plan and purpose. And when you do, you'll be fulfilled and you'll be happy as serving the great creator who designed you for the purpose that he has for you.